we're dying for a paycheck. The current model is making us ill. I see it in my clinic, in my patients who are these hard driving type A executives who are successful and they're dying from heart attacks. This capitalist drive for the bottom line is not serving us. The healthcare industry is like an industry like any others and, and needs to make a profit. Just like mechanics at the car shop, they make their money when something breaks. This idea that we can really separate the mind and the body and the mind and the heart is false. Your anger, your frustration, your joy, your love, these all leave actual fingerprints on the structure of your heart. Every month, someone come into the hospital with what's called a broken heart syndrome. As a cardiologist, as a heart doctor, what is the number one tip you have for us to mm. protect our hearts? Ah. <laughs> Oh man. Well, the first thing that we all must do is... Quick question. When did you discover that you're a leader, that your actions matter to those that look up to you? You may be an entrepreneur or an aspiring entrepreneur, innovating to change the world, or a CEO navigating a crisis, or a parent returning to work and learning to lead your career, your team, your children. There are many faces of leadership, and this is the podcast to explore them all. Welcome to Anatomy of a Leader with me, Maria Vorostovsky. I'm a headhunter and founder of HVO Search, where I help ambitious leaders hire their executive teams. My job today on this show is to help you discover your superpowers, to help you avoid making some of the same mistakes, and to remind you that even if you do, perfection doesn't and shouldn't exist. Thank you so much for listening and please do subscribe and follow this podcast because it really helps others to discover these incredible stories. This show will challenge the way you think and may even change your life. Jonathan, welcome to Anatomy of a Leader. Thank you so much for coming onto the show. What a pleasure, Maria. Since we first met uh, a couple of years ago online, I've been looking forward to this conversation. Yes, I've never actually seen your face. So I remember the clubhouse days of just yeah. being completely on audio and having the most interesting and very heartfelt conversations. And I'm just so happy to meet you today and so excited about your book that's coming mm. out next year and just everything that you're doing. You just... Mm. I don't know, you're one of these people that I have never met in person and now meeting online mm. that I have so much gratitude for, that, for the work that you're doing. And I don't know, I just feel like you're a very special person. So I feel really privileged to, to talk to you today. <laughs> it's very much mutual, Maria. Thank you so much. That, that means a lot to me. Mm. Well, let's start at the beginning, just for those people who don't know you, just to give, you know, a very, very quick introduction into who you are. Hmm. Who I am is, is changing, right? So my answer today, I'm going to allow that to be different than who it is tomorrow. But it wasn't always that way. I was so focused early on on who am I? What's my title going to be? I'm going to be a physician. I'm going to be a cardiologist. I'm going to be a leader in an organization. I'm, I'm a father. I'm a, I'm a sibling. So I have a lot of different titles. And yet, um, if you ask me, who am I? I'm someone who's very interested in what makes our hearts suffer, what makes us feel disconnected from ourselves, from other people, from our lives, and how can we restore those connections that lead to healing of our hearts in the broadest sense, um, not just as a doctor, which is how I spent the first 25 years of my career, but now as an organizational leader and as a coach and so many other things, thinking about the heart in its broadest sense and really um, moving and leaning into that new role, that new way of being. The, the, the backstory is that I'm the youngest of seven children, and I have my father to thank for becoming a physician. He was the town doctor. And my mother, I have her to thank for being fascinated by science. She was a, a physicist in the 1950s when it wasn't cool for women to do that in America. And she worshipped Albert Einstein and had a picture of him on our wall growing up. And so the seven children, all seven of us, pursued science. And I realized about 10 years into my practice that I needed to be something a little bit more than just a scientist and a geek and a nerd. There was something missing. And we can, we can talk about that. 
because it has applications for what I see as missing in the workplace, both in healthcare and in other industries. So going back to this, this missing piece, mm. what is the piece that you felt was missing and where did that come from? Mm. One of the big pieces that was missing, Maria, was a feeling that I was seen by the people around me and, and seen and allowed to be who I was. <laughs> I felt a disconnect between putting on this image for, you know, for my parents who I knew they wanted a straight A student. I knew they wanted somebody who would be a doctor or a lawyer or someone successful. Um, and I didn't necessarily get a lot of a sense that they wanted to hear what I was really interested in, which was a bit of philosophy, a bit of art, a bit of psychology, a bit of uh, a lot of emotions inside of me. And so the piece that was missing was I had feelings in my body. It was usually a, a twisting in my stomach, a quickening of my heart when I was in social situations. Uh, and I had very few words to name the emotions that I was feeling. Uh, and so I often went back to this very safe place for me, which I know a lot of uh, people in the technical fields go to, which was up in my brain. <laughs> I was told I was very smart. I had a high IQ, all this stuff that you've got and all of our colleagues have. And that's wonderful. But the piece that was missing was this whole other aspect of becoming a human being in this Western world that privileges achievement and accomplishment and whether it's financial or um, whether it's social, and not so much the value of one-on-one -on -one human relationships, which at the end of the day are what make our lives feel good. Mm. Is that mm. something that you felt early on, or is that something that you've arrived at later mm. on in your life? Yeah, I, I was an introvert as a child, and I'm still an introvert now. I'm pushing the boundaries of that. And I remember from a very young age, Maria, feeling like I was at the edge and the outside of my life looking in. I felt like an outsider. Um, people would call me a, a nerd or a geek or whatever it was, very socially awkward. I had a patch over one eye when I was five and six years old. I used to wear, my parents, my mom would put a bow tie on when I was a little kid in school. So I always felt a little bit uh, as an outsider, even in social situations, going through high school as well. And so I created this story in my mind you're different. You don't belong here. And of course, it tended to perpetuate itself. So I believe that I didn't fit in. There was something wrong with me, actually. Um, and my mind would take over and tell stories constantly, all day, every day, about um, how maybe I wasn't understood by the world. And that ended up being a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I would end up awkward acting even more awkward than I, than, I, than I thought I already was. And of course, people would say, oh, he seems like a nice person, very smart, but I wouldn't necessarily want to hang out with him because he doesn't make me feel comfortable with who I am. So I was very much inward focused. And um, most of my life's journey has been finding a place of steadiness inside of myself, um, not striving as much to be approved of, to learn to approve of myself and to love myself, so that now I can take my own lens, which is a strong lens, and shine it outwards and look at other people and see you for who you are and see what your needs are and see the people on my team. So I know that may not answer your question directly, but that's a bit of, um, of my journey of, of self-awareness, of inner healing, of, of allowing myself to be who I need to be. Uh, and and that is not a perfect person. And I think um, mm. so much of, of, of my early traps were falling into this, this myth of, uh, it, well, if you're perfect and if you succeed and you follow our rules of the game for success, we will give you a pat on the back and we'll give you security. And I ended up feeling very unsatisfied and very isolated and separate. So gone are the days where I see myself as different and uh, weird and living on the edge. Uh, yeah, I'm a keen observer of human beings. And yet at the same time, I am one. <laughs> and I feel deeply connected with others. So at which point did that change? At which point did you say, mm. actually, this internal dialogue isn't serving me? And mm. was there a specific moment where you realized that? Or have you yeah. always sort of secretly known, but just been working on it? And now that it's just become easier what was yeah. been your path? Yeah. 
There, there was one moment, Maria, when my life kind of uh, came crumbling down, and I don't think it would have crumbled so hard if I had early on uh, more skills in um, being authentic to myself, for standing up for myself, for loving myself, and also for uh, working with anxiety, which is something that I struggled with as a child, a teenager, and even as a young adult. And it was when my main support in my life... Um, so. Uh, my best friend was my sister, Andrea, one of seven children, and she was um, beautiful and she loved art and science and art history. And uh, she was my sort of spiritual friend. And when I was struggling with anxiety and depression in a family that uh, really made it not feel okay to share those things, and in a, an industry in healthcare where physicians are not allowed to show those things, she was the one person who allowed me and encouraged me to care for myself and to love myself and to seek help from a therapist. And so getting to your question, the time that I realized that, that something needed to change was when she was diagnosed with a brain tumor. This was back a little over a decade ago, and she was 44 with a young child. And uh, I knew that she wasn't going to be alive in five years. And so the one person who had been supporting me in my own transformation, I was going to lose her. So uh, weeping on the floor of my New York apartment with my young new wife looking on, uh, we both realized that something needed to change. And so that was the moment that uh, the, the rest of my life began. I'm so sorry. I mean, having somebody who is so close to you, who has been your, who has been the person who has seen you at your true authentic self and to go through that experience mm. is extremely difficult. Thank and you. isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. It's, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't trade it away. I mean, I wish I could have my sister back and in many ways she's here with me right now and in every encounter when I'm serving other people and when I'm trying to be kind to myself, she's there with me. Uh, and yet I've been able to find some meaning in a horrible loss, uh, for so many of us. So this is, this is part of life, right? Embracing that, bringing it into this moment for the benefit of other people. Mm. I think quite often in life, it's the most difficult moments that really provide the most amount of growth as painful mm. as they are. Mm. And well, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, yeah. and it's never easy to go through a loss of a, of a loved one, a parent, mm. anybody. Um, yeah. Going back to talking about being seen and mm. coming from a family where, you know, you're not allowed to express emotions, you know, mm. being in a, in an in industry where your profession also dictates that you're, you know, perfect, you know, everything. Yeah. And, Having gone through this experience and having looked at yourself and realized that actually this is no longer serving me, mm. what were the steps that you have taken to, to make that change? This, the steps and the framework has evolved, Maria. Uh, I originally took a very selfish approach, which was I need to get off of the floor. <laughs> I need to not feel so crappy all the time. And I, uh, I searched Google, honestly, I searched Google and I, the, the search that I put in Google was, how can I be happy again? That's how it began. So I'm, I'm grateful for the search engine. And that led me to What did this. they come up with? So uh, there were a thousand, a thousand hits, uh, but somewhere on the first page said, have you read about the field of positive psychology? And I said, well, I'm a medical doctor. I, I studied psychology and I, I studied psychiatry and I practiced a little bit in, in a hospital in New York. And, but this was something different. So as you know, the field of positive psychology is an attempt to flip hundreds of years of uh, the understanding of how the human mind works on its head. And instead of seeing us all as somehow broken and defective in needing of help and saving, what if we were to look at how we could be the best versions of ourselves to live a, a fully thriving and flourishing life. And I said, wow, 
<laughs> it seems like that may have some answers that I've been looking for. And the fact that it was based on evidence and science and not some form of esoteric mysticism, which couldn't be proven, that was all the better. That appealed to my intellect. Mm -hmm. And so, Maria, that's how I began. I read every single book, I've libraries of books of positive psychology. And then that led me into this rabbit hole of, well, one of the skills is mindfulness and meditation. And then if you really want to develop, you have to develop your body. And so I got into how do I take care of this body, which, believe it or not, I didn't learn in medical school. So I started to realize as I embarked on my own journey of discovery, moving towards health and happiness and fulfillment, I saw my patients who didn't know the first thing about that. All that we are taught as patients in this Western world is, well, you um, develop a medical condition, you're diagnosed with a disease or a disorder, you go seek help, and you'll get some kind of a fancy test or a, a treatment with potential risk until the next problem happens. And so I realized that there's this intersection now. We can view health and healing and happiness in a totally new way, which is not from a place of uh, we are broken, but from a place of we are already whole, we are already connected, and we become sick and ill emotionally, socially, etc. just when we forget how connected we really are and we stop caring for ourselves and for others. So that was the beginning of my journey. It's evolved since then. And the next phases of my journey after working on myself for many years, there was a slow turning outward, which I referred to before, looking outward and realizing that it's a bit self-centered. You know, you go to the bookstore and there's a there's a whole section on self-help. It's a billion dollar industry. And I think I think it misses the mark. I think we're misguided in telling other people to uh, help themselves. And yeah, we can help ourselves. We can heal ourselves. But I think the real healing happens in between us when when we connect with others, when we rely on others and when we commit ourselves to serving others. It's the only way that we're going to evolve as a as a society and that our workplace is going to evolve from a, a profit-oriented, competitive, market-driven uh, experience to something that's more deeply nourishing and, in the end, more successful and viable. There was a time when you know the Greek uh, physicians, the early ones, Hippocrates and others, uh, it really took a holistic view of health. And you don't have to look to the Greeks. You can look to the ancient Chinese and Chinese medicine. Uh, if you talk to them about <laughs> flourishing and human health, it, it doesn't necessarily begin with a, a test or a disease. It, it begins with, are you uh, taking care of the whole of your heart, which is not just are you sleeping well, eating well, exercising, but it's how are your relationships? What is your spiritual life like? What emotions are you experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis? And I think the reason that we've moved away from that in the West has to do with this modern model of medicine, which uh, evolved from the Industrial Revolution and this praising of the intellect and this very mechanical, uh, materialistic view of health, which is there is the body and then there is a spirit and they're separate. And I think fortunately, and I'm hoping to be part of this movement, this movement back towards healing and health as a holistic endeavor, uh, not just looking at the, as the body as the sum of these individual parts, but realizing that our emotions have a profound impact on our well-being. Uh, there's another reason, and it's purely financial. If you are a healthcare industry and you want to make a profit, it's very hard to profit on having people experience more joy <laughs> and more love and more connection, even though I know that those are the roots of real healing. You can't really put a dollar sign on that and it won't drive people into the office. So not to be cynical, but to be realistic, Maria, uh, the healthcare industry is like an industry like any others and, and needs to make a profit. And sometimes that can create these perverse incentives for doctors uh, and nurses and systems to want people to be sick in a way, just like mechanics at the car shop. They make their money when something breaks. And so um, everyone I know and I respect in healthcare, every healer that I know is calling for a return to a preventative approach to health. It's the only way that our, our systems, which are going to go bankrupt, uh, the only way that the healers themselves, the doctors and nurses who are burning out right now, we're facing a global shortage of nurses and physicians. 
which if people who are listening haven't heard about it, you can look this up. The statistics are quite frightening. It's not just our patients who are ill, but it is those of us who are committing our lives to helping others who are ill. We're ill with burnout and uh, it's making us physically sick as well. And so I'm committed to helping not just patients, but also the healers themselves and the organizations that support those healers to create uh, organizations that help us heal. If you are a person taking care of someone else, but mm. you're suffering yourself, mm. you know, we as human beings, we're so deeply wired for connection and for learning from other individuals, especially when we're in physical presence with them. So mm. if you as a patient picking up on, you know, just even things that are unsaid when mm. your physician is looking after you, or even the decisions that are being made based on, well, we need to arrive to a result faster, or, you know, I'm tired and, you know, need to, you know, deal with this really, really quickly, or mm. whatever it is, you know, we're mm. all at the mercy of what's happening to us internally. Mm. And I'm really pleased that you are addressing this mm. directly with regards to, well, you know, it's not just the patients that need care. Yeah. It's the people who look after them that need care as well. Yeah. Um, going back to your earlier point, do you think capitalism is at fault here? I don't think capitalism is at fault here. Um, I, I think, you know, the different ways that we humans have, have tried to organize ourselves at scale uh, and to cooperate, whether it's uh, capitalism, whether communism, Marxism, any kind of an ism, um, they all have uh, certain benefits. And some of them um, have proven the test of time and capitalism is here to stay. Uh, and it's because it taps into a very core human uh, drive, which is uh, to acquire more resources for ourselves and for our tribe and those people we identify with as part of our tribe. And, and that wiring, I don't think is going to go away uh, as long as we are just human. Now, with the advent of AI and augmented reality, um, I think what it means to be human is going to change. I'll come back for another conversation about that. Uh, and I think what I'm happy about, Maria, is that there's a shift in the way we define capitalism in the West uh, as a model. We, we are seeing that since the days of Milton Friedman, uh, a Nobel Prize winner in the 1970s in the US, who said the purpose of business is to make dollars for its stakeholders. I think a lot of us are rejecting that now, not out of ethical reasons, but for practical ones. We're seeing that the pure capitalist system without strict guardrails protecting the human spirit is doomed to fail. And it's already failing us and it's failing our environment and it's failing our physical health. And as um, um, Mark Pfeffer in Stanford wrote a book, we're dying for a paycheck. The current model is making us ill. And I see it in my clinic, in my patients who are these hard driving type A executives who are successful and they're dying from heart attacks. And I see it myself when I get chest pain because I'm overworked and over and underslept. And I see it among my colleagues who are planning to leave the field of medicine uh, because this capitalist drive for the bottom line is not serving us. So what does the future look like is a wonderful conversation. And there's a great conversation around this idea of conscious capitalism. And I'm very happy to be part of this. And this is part of our conversation today. And you've led many of these conversations. So I'm, I'm always learning from you about this. Talk to me about what conscious capitalism is. So I would say that capitalism is the unbridled competitive spirit um, to either make money or achieve power. Right? This is, this is what drives capitalism as opposed to other, other ways of organizing ourselves financially, which are more um, living on a commune, let's say, or sharing things equally, uh, looking out for those who don't have the resources to look out for themselves, some socialist aspects. And this is where it gets interesting between America and Europe, and there's some even conflict within America. Socialism is, is a bad word, it's a dirty word. And yet, um, what I mean by conscious capitalism is, uh, capitalism is very much in the head. Uh, and it's driven by our most base human emotions, which are more for me, less for you. It's based on this false notion of a zero-sum game, that if 
I win, you must lose. And for me to have more, you have to have less. And the conscious aspect of capitalism refers to our higher consciousness, those parts of our brain that are more fully evolved, literally, millions of years down the line from our more primal urge from the emotional center, the limbic system, which drives us to, to hate and to fight, <laughs> to act out in anger and rage. Uh, the more evolved parts of our human consciousness uh, allow us to connect with others, to empathize with others, to feel the hearts of others, to care about the well-being of others, not only within our small, narrow tribe of our family or our workplace, but in the broader universal tribe. This is what leads to true inclusion and belonging. Com conscious capitalism uh, encourages and creates um, environments, processes, uh, on, a, on a governmental level and also an organizational level that uh, bring out the best in human consciousness, which is tied to the um, aspects of the human heart around altruism, empathy, kindness, compassion, forgiveness. You've actually made me think, and that's the reason why I'm taking a pause here, because I have been grappling a lot with, well, how can we have more women in the workforce? What is preventing that from happening? And I'm beginning to realize that actually that's not necessarily the right question or even the right problem, mm -hmm. because I think a lot of it comes down to what you're discussing about this unbridled capitalism at all costs, this idea of competition about, you know, someone needs to win and someone needs to lose. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily a conversation about, you know, men versus women. It's mm. more about what we find valuable as a society and mm. the kind of qualities that we praise in our leaders, in people who are successful or who are influential. Mm. And when you're talking about conscious capitalism, it's about taking the higher levels and thinking, actually, we're not operating out of abundance here, even though we're accumulating lots of things and we are thriving, so mm. to speak, but actually operating out of what you're talking about, the limbic system and operating out of fear. And mm. these decisions are not even serving us because even if you're a very successful person who is working 24 hours a day, who is not taking any breaks, not looking after their health, working on their startup or working as a CEO, you know, running a, a huge company, you're not operating in your higher consciousness. Mm. You are still operating in that, from that place of fear. Mm. And I find that fascinating that, that actually a lot of our human existence, even our conscious human existence has been from running away from something rather than running towards something. Mm. And I'm really on board with the shift about let's take a minute here. Mm. have a you know engage this brain that we all talk about how amazing it is and how we're so special compared to other species mm. and actually use it wow. and go back to what does it mean to be human and what is the best part of being human and how can we do that for ourselves mm. and for others mm. so where do i sign up to this conscious capitalism like what do i do where do i go like what yeah, yeah. well I for love anyone who's listening like, what yeah. can what what do what must we do yeah i i think uh first of all i love what you just said there um and uh, fully endorse it and maria i think you are doing uh, by hosting conversations there's no more powerful way to create change in the world than inviting people into conversations that are honest, that are authentic, um, with integrity, uh, creating a safe sp space for people to explore new ideas and old ideas, uh, to, to come in with an openness of mind and openness of heart to allow new ideas to emerge, to not get stuck in old dogma and old beliefs and old ideas. Well, we did business this way, so it has to go on this way. Now, that way of rigid thinking is a thing of the past. The leaders of the future will fail unless they develop a flexibility. And I don't think it's a matter of choosing uh, a male style or a female style, of, of, of choosing between courage and compassion. I think, I think the best leaders that I know embrace both, both polarities there and can hold them both simultaneously. I am so fascinated with the idea of polarities 
because mm. every single day, every moment, I am faced with, you know, this is, you know, this is how you're supposed to do it. Or, mm. and then somebody else will come out and say, no, you're supposed to do it in exactly the opposite way. And what you said, it's exactly, it's about existing in the middle. It's about being able to hold two opposing ideas mm. and appreciating that they're both valuable and yeah. they both can be used in a different moments in time, in yeah. different intensity. And it's not one versus the other. It's both. We need both. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the root of wisdom. Yeah. That's for me, that's part of wisdom is being able to hold both, uh, and realizing that, uh, our brains are wired for both. Uh, we're wired for fear and we're wired for courage. We're wired to seek out resources and we're wired for greed. And we're also wired for sharing and for generosity. So we, we can't mm -hmm. avoid that. Once we try to deny it and we say, well, we're either this way or that way, you're either a, a, an angel or you're a devil. Um, this leads to cancellation, rejection, separation, and, and a lot of unnecessary suffering. Mm, for sure. Going back to what you were saying about the social connection and that it's not just about us looking at ourselves that we are broken it's up to us to fix it and i know there's a lot of talk about well happiness is your responsibility and i kind of gone through these phases of well first of all no there's things that have happened to me that i feel resentful about and that have impacted my happiness mm -hmm. then i went onto the bandwagon of well actually no happiness is my responsibility you know i have to take the things that i can control under my own control mm. but now having gone through quite a lot of emotional you know trauma and mm. learning about myself and i realized that it's not even about your own pain it's about how you connect with others and the yeah. ability to expose yourself showing vulnerability, being able to rely on someone mm. and seeing that reciprocity back to you, that you're not alone in this universe. And I think a lot of our issues as human beings come from feeling alone. Mm. And even if you're surrounded by people, it's the ability to feel connected to someone that determines the quality of your life. It determines mm. the quality of your health. It determines the quality of your success and you know your longevity it impacts absolutely everything yeah. and suffering in silence must be one of the most painful mm. experiences of being human and it's extremely terrifying if you have gone through any experience where you know for example you could not trust your parents or mm. you were not grown up with somebody who made you feel seen as you were yeah. saying before it's extremely terrifying to put your trust in somebody else because you've not experienced that reciprocity or somebody standing up for you. But if you don't do it, you miss out on that. I felt very alone and I mm. was in relationships and it was mm. accepting that I'm not perfect and accepting mm. that I will do things that are not great. And then yeah. seeing how yeah. almost like letting the ball drop and see what happens. Yeah. And then when I did, I was extremely surprised mm. how certain people in my life behaved, yeah. both in positive and negative ways. They yeah. have been negative where it was so unbearable that they left and they're no longer in my life. Mm -hmm. And then there were moments where it created such a deep connection and such deep trust that I feel like as a human being, and as a business owner and, you know, a parent, mm. I feel like I'm a lot more mentally resilient as mm. a result of that. I find that yeah. fascinating. It's like when you just let it go mm. and, but I think it also comes down to appreciating certain qualities in other people, which I don't think I did before. Mm. You know, we all complain about how, um, you know, this person's ungrateful or, you know, this person, you know, didn't treat me very well. But I think more often we need to look for the people who don't get that credit, who are there for you. And mm. maybe they are unglamorous. Maybe they're not even interesting. Maybe they are, um, you know, not successful in the traditional way. 
But mm. those are the people who stand by you and those are the people who make you a better person. And I think we need to spend more time thinking about them, what we can do for them, than worrying about all these other people who have no interest in your life whatsoever. It's beautiful, Maria. If I can pick up on that, I heard you discussing three themes there. You know, going back to the beginning when you were speaking about happiness and, and your own journey of where you thought happiness came from. And, and you're certainly not the first person, you won't be the last to ask this question of where does happiness come from? And, mm -hmm. and my wish is that you know we wouldn't have to spend decades. Maybe we could get the lessons earlier as children. Um, what kind mm -hmm. of a world would it be if we were all more grounded in happiness and joy within ourselves. So uh, on that conversation, there's an important distinction that it took me a while to learn, which was the difference between happiness as a momentary fleeting experience, more like pleasure, and happiness as something that is sustainable throughout one's lifetime and can happen even in the darkest moments and not happiness in terms of giddiness, but happiness in terms of a sense of fulfillment, satisfaction, and joy. And that's very much attainable. And yes, part of that comes from within ourselves and the way we interpret the world and the stories we tell. And a large part of it, in my own experience as a doctor and as an organizational leader, so much of my sustainable happiness comes in the fact that I try to serve other people and I think about how my actions affect them. And when I'm not acting in that way, I'm less happy over time. And then the, the second theme that I heard you speaking about was this idea of you know, the importance of social connection and how it determines our health and our happiness and all these things. Well, as we're hearing that more and more, and I'm happy that we're hearing that, and even the United States Surgeon General wrote a book and is, wrote a report on the value of social connection and the epidemic of loneliness as a key driver of our, of our ill well-being. That's Dr. Vivek Murthy. Many of us are left with this question of, well, I'm not naturally a very outgoing, kind, or even compassionate person. I'm a bit of a hard-nosed, hard-driving, I, I don't care about bedside manner. And so where does that leave this large segment of our leadership and our population? We can't leave people out. And so it gets to the third piece of what I heard you saying, which was in your own personal journey, you have been hurt, you've been wounded, you've been injured, and there have been people who've broken your trust. And I think you're not alone in that. And a lot of uh, toxic leadership behaviors that we see today come from leaders themselves who experience their own wounding. They may not have been aware of it. They may not have gotten the love and the nurturing that children need. And so what I'm fascinated by and what I think the work is that we all have to do together, whether it's in these conversations or the way that we spread these conversations in our own organizations and how leaders show up each day is this journey, this path from a feeling of betrayal, a lack of trust, a lack of nurturing, a lack of connection towards a feeling internally that we can trust ourselves again, that we don't judge ourselves for being injured and wounded, that we don't make ourselves, we don't blame ourselves for having been a victim of other people or organizations' behaviors. And so, and that's not an easy jump to make. And yet you are alluding to it, that it is a, a journey that's worth taking. And there are steps along the way that are very clear, getting to learn to trust again, because without being able to trust ourselves, we can't really trust others. We don't know what trust means. And many of us don't trust our own emotions because they're scary. And so it begins with a self-trust and then trusting a small circle, maybe one person or even just trusting ourselves to write something in a journal. And then eventually we can learn to not just trust other people, but really see them and to be there and reflect back at them. This is what coaching is. This is what leadership is. This is what mentorship is. This is what parenting is, real parenting is. It's being able to heal ourselves enough so that we can see other people. And then remembering that it's not a one and done fix that now I'm focused on another. It's a it's really a revolving lens where we're looking inwards, checking ourselves. What am I needing? Looking outward, this person that I'm trying to help, what are they needing? And sort of navigating that, that boundary between us. It's, it's fascinating, these themes that you brought up. I think it's developing self-compassion. It's about, it's empathy for yourself. When you can understand your own emotions, you can then understand somebody else's. And I really deeply believe that because mm. if you cannot give compassion to yourself, 
then mm. I think it's harder to give that to somebody mm. else. I'd love to talk about the book that you have in the works, Just One Heart. Mm. What do you mean by that? What does the title mean for you? Mm. It, it took me a long time to think about what I'm going to call this book. It's my first book and it's almost like a baby. You know, what am I going to call it? And how do I give it a name that others will instantly know, instantly know when you hear it, what it's about. And for me, it brings together uh, three aspects of my own journey of healing. And the first one is this idea that I was living as a brain <laughs> and not so much as a, as a heart. And so realizing that just one heart means that my emotions were affecting my physical health and uh, my physical health, whether I was exercising or not, were affecting my emotions. And this idea that we can really separate the mind and the body and the mind and the heart is false. And so just one heart means your emotional heart, Maria, is the same as your physical heart. Your, your anger, your frustration, your joy, your love, these all leave actual fingerprints on the structure of your heart. And I see every month someone come into the hospital with what's called a broken heart syndrome, where whether it's a mother who's lost a child or a, a husband who watched uh, something horrible happen to a family member, people come into the hospital with what looks like a heart attack. And it actually is the physical manifestation. So as a cardiologist, I can tell you that we have just one heart, the emotional and the physical. As a cardiologist and someone coming into your practice and they're saying, you know, there's something that looks like a heart attack. What are you seeing? Are you, are you mm. is it the symptoms that you're looking for? Are you looking inside the heart itself? Mm. Like yeah. what, from a biological perspective, mm. you know, or physical perspective, what are you seeing? Yeah. So it's, it's all of these things. It's the signs and the symptoms and the findings. So the first thing that I see is someone um, calls an ambulance because they're experiencing crushing chest pain and they can't breathe. It's usually it's one or two in the morning or it's sometimes it's been within 30 minutes of getting off the phone, learning that a loved one has died across the country, across the world. They start to experience a severe pain in the chest going up to the neck. So they call an ambulance and they come and they see the emergency room doctor and they call me. The second thing we see are the vital signs. So the heart is much faster, sometimes twice normal beats. Sometimes the heart's rhythm is out of whack because of this emotional strain. It's a storm. It's a storm of adrenaline that the heart is being exposed to that makes the heart behave as if it's having a classic heart attack, which is caused by a blockage. This is not caused by a blockage. This is caused by stress, sudden emotional stress. So it's the symptoms. It's the signs of blood pressure, heart rate, rhythm. And then it's the findings. It's the test results. If I look at your electrocardiogram and you're in the middle of this condition, which is called Takatsubo cardiomyopathy, also called stress cardiomyopathy, also called broken heart syndrome, discovered in the late 70s and 80s in Japan of all places, where they were finding that there was an earthquake and people who lived 100 miles away were having heart attacks. How's that possible? It was because of the stress of this natural disaster and the havoc that it was creating that people's emotional state was so imbalanced, it was causing them to end up in the hospital with exactly what I'm describing. And so it's called Takotsubo cardiomyopathy. And then we do blood tests and the blood tests show a release of the heart enzymes into the blood, which are a, typically a, a finding of someone who's having a heart attack. And then we do a picture of the heart. I do an ultrasound of the heart called an echocardiogram and I can see the heart is literally weak. A strong heart yesterday is literally weak today because someone lost their cat and they're grieving their cat. I've seen this. And the heart can be sometimes severely weak and it's not pumping. And the fluid backs up into the lungs and people can't breathe. And, we, and then we take them for the ultimate test. We do a catheterization where we put a little tube into the artery, look at the arteries of their heart. And guess what? No blockages in the heart. The good news here is that with uh, emergency treatment, with emotional support, sometimes with therapy, certain medications, it's got a wonderful prognosis. It can happen again though. And so part of the way that I support and treat my patients has changed since I began medicine 25 years ago. It's no longer just, we'll take these medicines and I'll see you in six months. It's, we need to address how you're coping with life's challenges and stress. And so this is what a broken heart syndrome is. It's a, it's a very important phenomenon and it 
not only costs a lot of money, it does cost some lives and it can create post-traumatic stress disorder in many of our patients. I'm sure most people would have experienced something along the lines where it does feel like there's something <laughs> physically wrong with your heart yeah. and say it's just that one moment, mm. but we're exposed to stress more and more, or at least we perceive, you know, stress more and more. What is the impact of chronic stress on mm. your heart? How much time do you have? <laughs> <laughs> How much time do you have? I have all day. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so the impact is very real. Uh, it's, it's recognized by the World Health Organization and the American College of Cardiology, the European Society of Cardiology, um, that emotional stress, uh, when repeated over and over on a chronic basis, can have devastating effects, not just on our cardiac health, but on our overall physical health not to mention our emotional health, of course. It can destroy our experience of our life, create overwhelming anxiety, sometimes depression, and has a negative impact on our social relationships, which comes back to that conversation where it's a negative spiral. To answer your question, when we experience short-term stress, it's, it's not a big deal. Our bodies are designed, you know, except for these extreme cases that I mentioned, which are, which, um, Usually it's someone who may be predisposed to that. Short-term stress, our body, our heart is meant to be ready for action. So our heart goes faster, no big deal. Blood pressure goes up a little bit. I'm ready for an interview. I'm ready for a, a, to lead a presentation in front of a thousand people, no big deal. It's stressful, but I'm not gonna have a heart attack. It's just my body getting ready. But if, let's say, that stress is perpetuated by an anxious mind, that is every day creating worry and worry and thoughts and beliefs about our role in the world and um, our future, that can lead to a rise in adrenaline in our blood, cortisol in our blood, constriction of our blood vessels, uh, thickening of our blood, uh, behaviors that uh, are we're attempting to use to soothe our stress. So if we don't know how to work with stress to manage it properly, we lean on, I lean on chocolate chip cookies. <laughs> so, uh, but taken too far, some people lean on cigarettes and others on alcohol and others on drug addiction and sex addiction and gambling addiction. There, there are many wise people who are seeing the roots of addiction as, as a response, a well-intended but, uh, but, but unfortunate response to stress and not having the resources that I hope to share with the world of other ways, healthier ways to cope with stress. So over time, stress, when left unchecked, um, causes us to be absent from work, to be less productive at work, and to end up having to see the doctor and spend thousands, if not more, on medical bills, when in reality, we could have prevented much of this by looking at the sources of stress within our dysfunctional organizations, looking at the sources of stress among our toxic leaders who often go unchecked, and looking at the sources of stress that we may have inherited from our parents, learned as children, or never learned to uh, adapt to. So what must we do if we find ourselves in this situation? Like, What should we, what is the one thing that you can suggest mm. to help manage the stress? You alluded to it early on, and it has to do with um, thinking uh, about what do we mean by stress? Um, if by stress we mean that the world is a challenging place and it changes and that other people behave in ways that we don't like, like cutting us off in traffic, well, if we believe that, then we are always going to be suffering from perpetual stress and the stories will never end. So I think the first step is, is realizing that stress is not what happens in the world. It's not what happens in the world. Those are stressors. Those are pressures. And this whole conversation about stress and burnout, if you go back 100 years, it was really a, a question, a conversation about physics. We weren't talking about stress in our emotional lives. We were talking about if you have a pencil and you bend it enough, that's stress and eventually it'll break. And a psychologist named Hans Selye said, oh, well, that can be applied to the human condition. And thinking about human response to stress, as a physics response. So Maria, the first thing that we all must do is to redefine our understanding of, of why we feel so stressed out. How much of it 
are the stressors in our life that we have not had the courage to stand up to, to walk away from, to change? And how much of it is the fact that it's not the stress out there, it's the stress that we create in here by these fantasies and fearful futures that we create in our imagination and that we believe in simply because they originated from our own mind and they're false. This really speaks to me. <laughs> it really does in terms of catastrophizing the anxious mind, mm. the constant rumination, mm. how it's so unempowering and how much it impacts not only your day-to-day -day experience of, of being alive, but also how much it impacts your physical body. So whatever's happening in your mind has mm. such a profound effect on your physical body. Mm. And it, as you're saying, as a physician, as somebody who's studying it, who's looking at you know, blood mm. results of people coming into the hospital, that mm. it has this profound effect on that. Yeah. And what about anger? Mm. <laughs> What about, what about anger? I love anger. <laughs> I used to be afraid of anger. And uh, in fact, that was one of my greatest fears is that I spent so many uh, years and decades trying to copy my father, who was a very calm man, very gentle and calm and never, ever, ever expressed anger. And so I thought, well, if I just copy my dad and I don't ever act angry, then that must be the, the right way to be. And what I didn't realize is there was a lot more going on underneath his surface, um, mm -hmm. a lot of work to be done around anger, that if we don't do that work, anger can be incredibly dangerous and damaging. So I see anger as a wonderful uh, emotion. I know that sounds strange. Anger is a powerful indicator. If we use it as such, if we don't let it carry us away into action, which is what it was designed for, we're wired for anger. But in order to go back to what we were talking about earlier is to reach that higher state of consciousness, in order to reach that state, we have to be smarter than our inherited wiring. Millions of years of evolution have made us want to jump to anger and rush to anger. And I've done it many times with my family. And I've often lived to regret it. And I sometimes <laughs> still hear about it. Remember when daddy acted this way. And so the way I approach anger now is through the lens of mindfulness practice, which is you know, very helpful in dealing with all emotions, good, bad, and in between, to see all emotions, including anger, uh, not as things to be avoided or to be afraid of or confused by, but simply as our body's best effort to give us useful information to act upon. But in order to wisely work with anger that comes up because of all the injustices that happen in the world, real or perceived, more often perceived, I would say, we have to create some space inside of ourselves to see the anger arising from a distance and early on. Because one thing about anger, the way that it's designed, evolved, is it's evolved so that it's very hard to escape from once it's taken its hold of us. And many, of my, I certainly have experienced that, and you may have as well. And so in my experience, in order to become skillful with anger, we take a, an attitude that it's a useful emotion. It's pointing us in the direction of something that's incredibly important to us. And it's our job to ask which of our core values has been violated. And then we have to develop practices between the mind and our body to become aware of what's happening in our body at every moment. When the world is telling us to be distracted, to look out there, we have to be checking in with our body. So that as Matthew Ricard, who wrote a wonderful book on happiness says, it's a lot easier to extinguish a spark of anger than an inferno. Once it blows up, it's very hard to retract from that. It's almost like yeah. completely overtakes your body. You were talking about stress mm. and how some people will literally call the hospital saying that they're having a heart attack. Does something ha similar happen with anger? Do people get so mad that actually they end up in hospital thinking that something wrong with their heart? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Uh, not just in the hospital and in my clinic. And uh, every single week, Maria, I have patients 
and I'm trying to be very sensitive about the way I approach this, where I need to speak with them about anger. But not just anger, it's anger is an umbrella. There's frustration, there's resentment, there's hostility, there's cynicism, there's so much that's beneath anger that drives anger that we have to look at. Now, I'm not a psychiatrist, I'm not a psychologist. Maybe I could have been one in another life, but I, I feel like it's my obligation as a heart doctor to address some of these things in the seven or eight minutes that I'm allowed according to our Medicare reimbursement. Um, because unless we do this, the same gentleman, and it's, it's often a man, but not always, who doesn't even realize that his day-to-day -day interactions with others is driven by some form of resentment or anger, either at the world, maybe it was about his, about his parents that he didn't even realize it and that he's transferring that anger towards other people or the people that he works with. Um, anger is something, um, it's like a burning stone that you pick it up, you think you're going to throw it to hurt someone else, and you're the one who gets burned from it. So I see people who struggle with anger have um, worse social relationships. So they lose that benefit of resiliency and social network and support that protects our hearts. I see anger as uh, leading people towards uh, soothing that anger, often with cigarettes and alcohol and drugs and other habits. Um, I see anger as driving blood pressure higher. And that blood pressure can damage the delicate blood vessels of our heart, our brain, our kidneys, and our other vital organs. And so anger has countless negative effects on our hearts and our bodies. And if we're not aware of those effects and we're not committed to working skillfully with anger, it can define our entire lives. Repressing any emotion or mm. experiencing it once the initial stressor has mm impacted us once mm. that's gone away what you're talking about how it just keeps coming back over and over even if the stress is no longer there mm. but it's still it's almost like it's entered your system and it has no outlet it has nowhere to go so it just keeps on you know activating the cardiovascular and the stress response in your you know the hormone response inside you mm. and the ability to tackle that, to deal with it, mm -hmm. to find some sort of an outlet to understand mm -hmm. what's happening psychologically will mm -hmm. improve your physical health because you need to be able to deal with it. So no emotion, you know, anything that causes you stress, anything that causes you anger, it's all there for a reason. Mm -hmm. Susan David, who wrote a book about emotional agility, she calls emotions as data. It's something that giving you an understanding of how you are interacting with the outside world, whether it's people, whether it's the environment, wherever you are. And yeah. it's this mind body connection, or you call it the mind heart connection. Susan Maybe. is wonderful. And she, if you couldn't tell has influenced my thinking. I was fortunate to have had to interview her for the book among 50 other mind heart experts. Um, and so her, her voice and wisdom comes out in just one heart. So, yeah, it's um, it's true. And, and what I love what you said there, Maria, was and I don't think I address this, which is it's one thing to understand anger, to think about it, to have an approach. But it has an energy about it, like all emotions that has to come out somehow. And you really hit on that. And for some people that may go to a, a boxing gym or it may go run a race or swim in a pool or or some people, it may be writing a song about anger but, or walking outside, but the energy has to come out. And for me, for me and for many introverts uh, and people pleasers, there's an important uh, step in the journey of healing from anger, which is expressing and communicating it and learning to develop our own voice and not being afraid to assert ourselves and to express anger and not being afraid of it. And I just wanted to highlight that for anyone who's listening that may be has had trouble expressing anger and it tends to bottle it up. And this gets to the work of Gabor Mate, uh, who's a Canadian physician who wrote a book, When the Body Says No. And he writes an entire book about how if we repress our anger and our frustration at other people and we don't learn to stand up for ourselves, we become physically ill. So what can we do? As a cardiologist as a heart doctor what is the number one tip you have for us to mm. protect our hearts ah <laughs> oh man well fortunately uh, there's lots of tips and tricks and all these things i tend and i'm just going to say this 
Um, I think tips and tricks are great, but it's almost like if somebody wants to go fishing and you give them the fish, I'd rather teach people to fish. So with my patients, I'll give them a few tips, but what I'll really focus on is can we develop characteristics and human qualities, human qualities, virtues, so that once you develop those, you don't have to think about tips and tricks anymore. If you develop the capacity for compassion, let's say, for warmth in your heart, no one has to remind you to say a kind word to someone else that you don't know. It just happens naturally. So I'm just going to say that. And in the book, I speak about seven timeless traits of the heart. I don't speak about seven tips of the heart <laughs> because I think um, the Internet and uh, influencers and gurus are really happy to give tips and tricks. Um, and I think at some point it leaves us wanting. And so this is where I'm fascinated by the wisdom that's been around for thousands of years. And I'm going to tell you what the tip is. <laughs> the tip is, you said it before, which is developing a compassion for ourselves. When we really respect ourselves, uh, listen to ourselves, care for ourselves, uh, we, and love ourselves and embrace all aspects of ourselves, the good, the bad, the light, the dark, all of this, and all of our humanity, and we don't constantly judge ourselves, uh, we can then learn to do exactly the same thing with other people. And there's this beautiful upward spiral that we jump right on when uh, I'm, I'm able to be with you and to see the good in you, even it, whereas other people might want to criticize you. I, it's, I'm not interested in that. I'm not interested in that. And so I think the, the main tip in healing our hearts in all aspects, the physical, the emotional, social, the spiritual, is to bring more kindness, gentleness, and love towards ourselves, uh, which can go against our um, education, our priming, or even evolution, which teaches us to be more critical. Well, on that note, Jonathan, thank you so much. I think the work you're doing is fantastic. And I am so grateful to have you in my life to remind me of these wisdoms and to follow your journey and to support you in publishing your book and mm. again from the bottom of my heart thank you so much for for coming mm. on the show and well, what's the best way for people to find you and perhaps even to pre-order your book uh, maria thank you for your very very kind words and ever since we first had our conversation on clubhouse and you allowed me you invited me into your incredible conversations i said she's, she's incredible amazing um, yeah. And so to be back with you and have this conversation and hopefully see you in London next year for the book tour Definitely. would be amazing. Um, thank you for all of that. Uh, the best way is either on LinkedIn to, uh, to find me, Jonathan Fisher, MD, or any social media. I, I have a cute little moniker, which is Happy Heart MD. Happy Heart MD is one word. And if you're interested in the book, if you go to justoneheartbook.com, you'll learn all about it. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Jonathan. I really appreciate your time and your energy. And I don't know, just the way you're smiling, it just, you know, makes my heart, you mm. know, sing. And mm. yeah, thank you so much. This is a blast, Maria. You're awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Jonathan. <laughs> thank you so much for joining me here on Anatomy of a Leader. What were your takeaways? And if you haven't already, I'd love for you to subscribe and follow this podcast. And I'll see you in the next episode.